my name is Jorid Beklund Sarli, and I'm working together with Emily Da Silva at the National Research Center for the Working Environment in Copenhagen, Denmark. And I would like to present lung surfactant inhibition as an alternative acute inhalation toxicity test. So the endpoint that we are aiming to replace is acute inhalation toxicity. There are accepted uh, test guidelines from OECD, the 403, 436 and 433. The endpoints are death and evident toxicity and there are presently no accepted alternatives. So the test that we are using uh, is represented in the first column of this uh, table. So we have looked at uh, several different uh, products that are off-the-shelf products. And uh, uh, the first of these products have known uh, toxicity to humans. So this is the last column in the table. Uh, people have inhaled these products and become ill. So we have tested the products in the in vitro test, and we have tested them in uh, uh, live animals to see what happens. And the in vitro test was positive, and uh, the um, animals uh, became sick from inhaling these products. So there was a correlation between the in vitro and the in vivo tests. We uh, bought uh, several products so that we could have a broader background. Uh, so uh, we have a group of products that we do not know if they are toxic to humans. Uh, but when we tested them in the in vitro test, they inhibited the lung surfactant function. When these products were tested on animals, they were also toxic. In the group of these products, we had some uh, that did not uh, affect the lung surfactant function in vitro. These were not toxic to animals, so there was also a correlation uh, for these products. We had, however, uh, a few products that were positive in the in vitro test that did not affect the animals when they were tested. So these were false positives. If you did only the in vitro test, you will have the result that they were toxic when they were in fact not, not toxic to uh, the animals. We did not have any false negatives. So uh, products that did not affect the in vitro test, but were toxic when they were tested in the animals. So uh, as you know, the airways uh, branch, and uh, as farther down you come into the airways, the diameter becomes smaller and smaller. From the 17th to the 23rd generation of branching, we have the respiratory part of the lungs. And this is the area that we are trying to model with our in vitro method. So uh, the respiratory parts of the lungs consist of the respiratory bronchioles and the alveoli. These parts of the lung are covered by a thin liquid called lung surfactant. There is an uh, alternative integrated testing strategy gap when concerned to lung surfactant. Most uh, cell-based lung toxicity assays do not incorporate lung surfactant, but lung surfactant has a vital function. This is a uh, schematic of an alveoli. Uh, the uh, walls are cover covered by uh, type 1 cells, which are very thin to allow gases to diffuse uh, across into the blood. And we have type 2 cells that produce the lung surfactant. The lung surfactant is mainly made up of uh, phospholipids and uh, surfactant-associated proteins. So the 
function of the lung surfactant is to regulate surface tension. Uh, surface tension is uh, the tension that is on a droplet, for example, here is water, where the molecules inside the drop are affected by all its neighboring molecules, whereas the molecules that sit in the air-liquid interface are only affected by the molecules surrounding it in the surface. These molecules are pulled into the liquid and this creates a surface tension of the drop. For water, the surface tension is so high that you can uh, place a coin on the surface of water and small insects can walk on water. If you had this kind of high surface tension in your lungs, uh, your lungs would collapse. So in the top of this graph, you can see normal alveoli where you have a low surface tension. But uh, if you inhale something that destroys the lung surfactant function so that you have high surface tension, the alveoli will start to collapse. In this figure, the phospholipids are presented by the blue line uh, that covers the air-water interface. The phospholipids have associated proteins, the SPB and the SPC protein. And the function of these protein, proteins are to uh, help the phospholipid uh, assemble below the air-water interface. So when the film is compressed, when you take, uh, when you expire, the surface of your lungs becomes smaller and the phospholipids are squeezed out of the air-liquid interface. When you take a breath in and your uh, surface area of your lungs becomes larger again, the, these proteins help the phospholipid integrate into the air-liquid interface very quickly so that you can uh, have a stable um, surface tension. So uh, the, uh, we measured the surface tension in the constrained drop uh, surfactometer. Uh, the uh, whole instrument is built into a heating box so that you have a stable temperature. This is both because lung surfactant is very dependent on temperature and because we have a quartz crystal microbalance adjacent to the lung surfactant in the chamber. The quartz crystal, crystal microbalance is also very sensitive to temperature. Uh, the, the microbalance is there so that we can have an estimate of what lands on the drop of lung surfactant in the chamber. Uh, we have designed the chamber so that we have a flow through of air uh, with the, the aerosol that we are using to expose to have a more realistic exposure. Uh, the exposure chamber can be uh, combined with any kind of aerosol generator. So we can expose both to dry powders and uh, liquids. The method is fast and easy and uh, testing a, a chemical is, uh, can be done at the low cost. We have a camera and the light source in the CDS that is constantly taking picture of the lung surfactant drop. So these pictures are analyzed uh, by soft a software called ADSA. Uh, the software uh, measures the contact angle and the shape of the drop and uses this to calculate surface tension. Uh, this drop that you can see here is a water droplet, so you have very high surface tension. But if you place 
a drop of lung surfactant in the chamber, you have a low surface tension uh, even if you are uh, not manipulating the drop. If you simulate an out breath so that the volume of your lungs and the surface area of your lungs becomes smaller, the drop is compressed and you have very low surface tensions. So this is an example of an experiment. Uh, we have a drop of lung surfactant. Every dot on this graph represents a picture of a drop that has been analyzed for surface tension. As the drop becomes smaller, the surface tension goes down. And as the drop uh, is made bigger again, the surface tension goes up. So this is simulating uh, breathing in the lungs. If we then expose the lung surfactant uh, to something that we want to test, in this case, something that was harmful, we compress the drop in the same frequency and uh, in the same amount as in the top uh, graph, but the surface tension does, do, does not go down when the drop is compressed. So in an alternative integrated testing strategy, uh, lung surfactant function is a point of entry measure. Lung surfactant should be added to air-liquid interface cell-based assays for more realistic exposure scenarios. And this is because we know that uh, the first barrier that uh, any inhaled particle will meet is the lung surfactant. So any particle will be covered with lung surfactant before it meets any cells of the lungs. Lung surfactant function can only be assessed in a dynamic assay, so this should be done separately. Disruption of lung surfactant function can be included in an IATO to determine the potential for causing acute inhalation toxicity. So the applicability domain for this method is uh, first of all impregnation products. We have done a lot of work testing uh, impregnation products uh, with this method. So impregnation products are frequently used both by professionals and by consumers. They make surfaces water and dirt repellent and they are so that they are easy to clean. They are free, freely available in uh, supermarkets or in home improvement stores. The problem is that they cause acute inhalation toxicity on a regular basis. We have also used this method to assess inhaled pharmaceuticals. Uh, we have uh, published uh, tests with marketed formulations, and we have a publication with excipients that is an in review. Uh, inhaled pharmaceuticals are used to treat lung diseases where you inhale particles uh, intentionally and uh, on a regular basis and you can do it for a whole lifetime so knowing if they will interact with the lung surfactant is very important nanoparticles is another uh, uh, class of uh, substances that have been tested in this method and they can reach deep into the lungs and they can interact with lung surfactant. Uh, so the future work that we are doing is the work with enhancers for biopharmaceuticals. So this paper is presently in review. We are also testing nanoparticles in an EU project called Smart Nanotox. We are testing per and polyfluorinated compounds in collaboration with the Norwegian Institute of Public Health. 
we are together with the Danish Poison Center and the Danish EPA. Uh, we have a surveillance of problematic impregnation or spray products uh, that people become ill after using. We are looking at cleaning products that come in spray form. And we are looking at chemicals that have a known reported LD50 after inhalation tested in the OECD methods that I mentioned in the start of the presentation. And we plan to submit the pre-submission form to Erl Ekva. Uh, thank you for listening to me. And I would like to acknowledge all the people that have uh, contributed to this work and uh, funded uh, the work that we have done. And I have included a list of references so that you can read more about the work done with this method. Thank you.